Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. Uh, in this video, I'm gonna go sort of soup to nuts all the way through the ZFC. I'm gonna go through every menu and talk about how I have mine set up. Now, your needs might be slightly different than mine, but I'll, I'll kind of try to address that as I go through how you might customize yours and just think about customizing it. Um, I have to get people asking me for a backup uh, just give me the file to set mine up like yours. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I think you need to go through this with me and understand the reasons why I'm making the decisions that I do. I think the ZFC is a wonderful street shooting family camera, a great camera for someone who's just getting into photography in your life or who just absolutely loves the old aesthetic of the you know Nikon manual cameras. It really kind of tugs at my heartstrings. I want to thank B&H for giving me this camera to review through this period and to do this setup video with. I did a full-blown review of it. I'll put a link to that video along with links to buy this from B&H. Those links help me out a little bit and I really appreciate it. Um, I will say I absolutely love this 28 millimeter 2.8 lens that you can get with it as a kit. I've got more details about all that stuff in that review video. So let's, let's dive in uh, and talk about how to set this camera up. This camera is a little bit different than a lot of other cameras. Instead of an ISO button, you've got a dial, kind of old school. Instead of a button to switch modes or a command dial to switch modes, you've got this little switch here that goes from manual to aperture, to shutter priority, to program mode or auto right here. So if you put it all the way up at the top, it's on manual mode. Uh, there's no button to press to go into aperture priority mode when you're in the, or, or to go into auto ISO. So that's something we'll talk about maybe setting up in the custom menus to be able to access really easily. On the right side of the camera, we've got an actual physical shutter speed dial. Right now I'm at a 15th of a second. I got to actually turn this big beautiful dial to change shutter speeds. And you can see it affecting my exposure as I go ahead and do that. You suddenly see the exposure meter getting underexposed and dead on the meter there at 1 1 25th of a second at f2.8. The f-stop for lenses, most of these lenses that you're gonna use with this, you use that, you roll that wheel like you're accustomed to um, up front. And there's a little readout that tells you what f-stop it is. It's also gonna be inside in your viewfinder and up on the LCD screen. You'll notice, you know, if people are wondering why I have a couple cords hanging out of this, my white cord is plugged into a power delivery capable um, AC wall plug, so it's actually powering the camera while I do this review. And the black cable is running over to a switcher into my computer so I can record the screen for all of you. You got your shutter button on off switch around the shutter button, video button, which is actually programmable, exposure compensation dial, old school back there, front and rear wheels. There's an AEL, um, AFL button that I like to map to back button autofocus. There's a play button and a delete button over on kind of where I think of as the wrong side on this left side. And then a monitor uh, viewfinder control button sitting next to those two buttons, this little button here. And when I press that, I can switch it to be monitor only, which is probably what we're gonna use for this review. I can switch it to be automatic display switch. When I put my eye up to the viewfinder, it's gonna switch to the internal viewfinder. I got a button that's, mo that's monitor only again. So it kind of auto display switch, monitor only. There we go, we'll go monitor only. All right. So let's delve into some of the menus. You know, there's an eye menu here. You can touch the touch screen or you can hit this button out on the, on the body up above your multi-selector here, the eye button. And you've got all kinds of options there for quickly accessing settings you might wanna change. And that's programmable. I'm gonna talk as I go through the menu settings about how I program my eye menu. But for example, if you wanted to turn exposure delay mode on, I could put a half a second of exposure delay in just like that, or I could turn it back off. Um, simple as that. Hit the shutter button to get out of there. So it's really nice, you know, drive mode. There's no drive mode button on this camera, so I like to keep the drive mode button right there. I can use the touch screen and say I want high speed continuous or go back to single shutter, boom, hit the okay button, we're back in. All right, so you get the idea. That's a really handy way to get to things that you use all the time. I'm gonna jump in to, oh, and there's display modes. You've got different, you know, display modes, live histogram, level, uh, just a kind of a big display of everything that's going on with the camera. All that stuff's accessible right there. And when you're in uh, your, your playback mode, you've got a, a magnify or shrink 
button, plus or minus right there. So let's go in, let's go into the menus. That's what this is really all about. And the first thing I have when I go in is generally my My Menu. These are more settings. They might not be up in the iMenu, but they're things I frequently want to access. I told you auto ISO sensitivity. I want to be able to turn that on or off because I don't have a physical switch like I would on the Z6, Z7, Z62, Z72, D850, the cameras I'm used to. This is just a little more limited that way, even the Z50. With that ISO button, you hold that down, roll the front wheel, and it turns auto ISO on and off. The back wheel changes the base ISO. So that's missing, so I just put it in the My Menu. All right, we're going to talk about how to do all that. I'm going to run up to the top of the menus by just pushing that multi-selector button to the left or tapping on the touch screen. I can go up, you know, up and down. It's kind of like a joystick in a video game, this, this multi-selector wheel around the OK button. We're going to the playback menu. The first thing, I, you know, you can, I, I'm not going to mess with folders. That just tells it, you know, when it's renaming what. But I go into playback display options. There are some things I always want to see in here. I want to see the RGB histogram. I don't need all these others necessarily. Your choices might be different than mine. I get all the exposure information I really want from my red, green, and blue histogram. I want that to show up as I scroll through, and I want a vision of just the photograph only, nothing but the photograph, nothing to get in my way. So that's my settings for what do I have in playback display. Picture review. I generally leave that off. I don't want a brief view of the image I just took to interrupt my shooting, so I tend to leave that off. Some people might love it. Rotate tall. I turn that off mainly because it makes my view of the image really small when I have that turned on. When I shoot a lot of vertical frames, it displays them vertically in this horizontal screen, and it makes them really small to look at. I'd rather look at them sideways big on the back screen. So. That I choose, I choose not to rotate tall. Okay, I'm gonna go into the photo shooting menu. Uh, in the photo shooting menu, we've got what's the name of the storage folder? What's the name of the file? You could go in and customize it. You know, I could put my initials HPH in there if I wanted to. What's your image area? There are, you know, different, you could shoot it in a wide screen, sort of film 16 by nine. You can shoot square one by one. If you wanna use the whole sensor, just use the 24 by 16. Uh, DX size. There's your image quality. You could go in and you could shoot JPEGs if you want. I keep that in my iMenu as well. There's what is the bit depth for your raw photos. I'd like to get the most bit depth I can. That gives me more dynamic range and more color information. There's your ISO sensitivity settings. You can set maximum ISO sensitivity. I generally would probably leave this camera down around, no, I don't know, maybe 16,000 ISO, maybe even 8,000 ISO, unless I really need more, all right? Uh, same thing with flash. You can set your minimum shutter speeds just to be automatic, depending on what lens you're using. Um, coming back out of that with a left push of the multi-selector, uh, your white balance settings, picture control. You can leave that on automatic, let the camera decide. Otherwise, I tend to use neutral because it generally represents better what I actually have photographed with my RAW files. Um, it doesn't give you that kind of punch. Even though you're shooting RAW, there's a little JPEG rendered in the camera to represent what you just photographed, and these picture control settings are applied to that JPEG, even though they're not really applied to the RAW file, and it isn't gonna be represented when you bring your RAW file into your image editor, your RAW editor of choice. So I tend, if I'm shooting RAW, which I always am, to just leave it in neutral because it gives me a better representation of that, that raw data. I'll be a better judge of whether I've blown highlights or shadows. Color space, I'd rather have Adobe than sRGB. It's a wider color space for my files. Um, I leave the active D lighting off. Long exposure noise reduction, you can choose whether you're using that or not. High ISO noise reduction, I don't mess with because I shoot raw files. I leave that turned off. I'd rather do it in my post-production software where I have more control anyway. Uh, vignette control, I leave that at normal. It does a nice job building that into the files so the software can apply it. Uh, diffraction compensation, you know, a lot of the stuff I don't mess around too much with. Metering, I like to leave on matrix, except occasionally I use spot metering. You know, that's for that scene where it's a darkened big space and there's one shaft of light highlighting someone sitting at a table. You've all seen that black and white shot of a shaft of light lighting a table in a completely black scene. Well, you set spot metering to the person sitting at the table to get the exposure perfect on them and let the whole rest of the scene go to black. 
those rare situations where the camera might make a bad decision. We're not going to talk a lot about flash. This camera doesn't even have a flash. So if you're going to do flash photography with it, you're going to need to, to jump in and, and, and delve into that a little bit more. But it's pretty simple. Flash compensation in what mode. Um, you've got release mode. That's the same thing we talked about. You know, are we in a single frame or multi-continuous? Focus modes, we'll put that in the I menu as well, but you can choose between manual focus, continuous autofocus where it continues tracking a moving subject, single servo autofocus, or let the camera make the decision for you. I'm generally in single servo autofocus, continuous autofocus for moving subjects. I use single area autofocus for landscapes and such. Manual focus, when everything's locked down on a tripod and I'm making my own decisions, I can zoom into 100%, check my focus is perfect. Um, auto exposure bracketing, I'm going to put that in my, uh, my my menu. That lets me go in and say I want to take, say, two frames, one on the meter, one going underexposed, and I'd like my exposure increment to be three. So I'm capturing one on the meter, one three stops underexposed. Or I could go up and say I'm capturing three images, one three stops underexposed, one on the meter, one three stops overexposed. And you get a little representation as you do that. You can go up to five if you want, and you can change that increment and number of shots. By going to zero, you're basically turning it off. Hit OK. Multiple exposure, high dynamic range. I don't do in-camera high dynamic range. I'd much rather do that in post. Interval timer shooting, that's what I use for doing time-lapse work. I put that in my menu. Uh, time-lapse video I never do internally in the camera. I'd much rather just capture a series of raw files that I can work with like a raw file and then blend into a video. Focus shift shooting, that's for focus blending. Uh, and it's phenomenal. It just captures a series of images from close focus to distance using your series of settings. I put that in my Maya menu. It's a really cool feature. It deserves its own full video. Silent photography, just so that there's no shutter sound whatsoever and you can be completely quiet and not disturb, say, the wedding that you're shooting. I put that in, uh, actually, I put that on my I menu. Going to your video modes, you know, you've got a whole bunch of different subjects. I'm not going to take a lot of time in here. It's up to say that if you want to shoot 4K at 24 frames a second, which is my favorite, you would say 3840 by 2160, 24P. 24P is 24 frames a second. If you want to do 1080 slow motion, you could do 120 frames per second at 1080 by 1920. I stick with this for most of my work, and this does beautiful video work, by the way. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about all these other video settings. There's the ability to go in, um, change a lot of the same settings that you have for shooting stills. Let's go through the custom settings. There's a lot of them. Um, this basically is asking you whether you want a priority of release or focus when you're tracking action in continuous auto area, or continuous autofocus. I leave it on the shutter. I'd rather capture the frame, even if it's slightly out of focus. Uh, autofocus shutter priority or, or single servo where it's not, it's locking focus. I would rather have it focused, make sure it's focused before I can release. So my, my priority is on focus in AFS mode and it's on release in, in autofocus continuous servo where it's tracking action. Um, you can fine tune your tracking, whether or not say a tree comes between you and your subject, how quickly does the camera switch to tracking the tree when the subject goes behind it? How long does it wait for the subject to emerge from the other side of the tree? You play around with this. I generally find the base setting at three works really well for me. Um, the number of focus points used. I like to use all the points with the ZFC. Um, some cameras, you know, sometimes you might want to be able to move around quicker between focus points on the screen. That's a choice you can make there. Store points by orientation. I like to leave this active. That way when I'm shooting vertically and I've got my focus point set at the bottom right part of the frame and then I flip to horizontal it'll and I move the focus point to the bottom right point of the frame. If I flip back to vertical, it will remember where I was last when I was vertical. If I flip back to horizontal, it remembers where I was last when I was horizontal and it automatically keeps it there. AF activation, this is back button focus right here. This is how you set back button focus by saying AF on only. That becomes the AEL AFL. It's a little confusing, but that little AEL AFL button right here beside the back dial that your thumb rests on so naturally down below your shutter speed dial is right there. That's the AF on only. Now, I leave this in the My menu as an option to switch so that when I hand it off to somebody to take a photo of my family and I, I can switch it over to shutter 
autofocus because most people that you hand the camera to, if they're not a photographer, don't understand about back button focus. Back button focus is a much more powerful and nuanced, controlled way to work with your camera and focus. But a lot of people have been trained to think that pushing the shutter button halfway should focus, then pushing it all the way to shoot. I like to disengage my focusing from my shooting, um, but not everyone does. So that's where you change that. I would highly recommend back button autofocus for almost everything you do. You can limit the different area modes that you can choose. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but there's a whole bunch of them. You can choose whether or not you want them activated or not. You just run through here. You can check and uncheck them and then select OK once you've made your decisions. Focus point wraparound, that's something I find highly confusing, honestly. That's where if you go off to the right side of the screen, your focus point pops up again on the left side of the screen. I, I never turn that on. Some people might love it. I find it just throws me off. Focus point options, you know, you can go in there. I, I like to leave the, the on for manual focus and for, uh, and for dynamic area autofocus assist. Low light autofocus, I definitely always turn that, leave that turned on. It slows everything down in low light situations and nails a perfect focus. Now I could see a situation where you're trying to track action in a darkened room and you'd rather be able to take shots than get perfect focus, but for the kind of work that I do, especially when I'm working in low lit sun, you know, post sunset situations, blue hour stars, you can actually focus on stars with these cameras with a fast enough lens it'll focus on a bright star or planet using pinpoint autofocus and AFS with low light autofocus turned on. It's amazing. It's just completely mind bending. The built in AF assist illuminator, I generally leave that off. I find it more annoying more often than it is beneficial. Easy exposure compensation, that's a choice you can make. I generally leave it on with this camera. You can just turn this dial to do exposure compensation. What is your choice for center weighted metering if you're going to use it? I never use center weighted metering, so I don't really change it. You can, you can adjust that as you wish. Um, you can fine tune optimal exposure. Um, I, I have found that the camera does a great job out of the box. If you need to fine tune it, this is where you go to do it. Um, your auto mode compensation, I, I don't know. I never use the auto mode, so. I don't know whether it's a good idea to turn. I think, I think it lets you do exposure compensation when you're in the auto mode. I don't use auto mode, but it would let you make the image a little bit darker or a little bit brighter if it seemed too dark or too bright to you while you're in that auto mode. Um, shutter release button, AEL. I leave that off. I don't want it to lock exposure when I press the button halfway. It's something you might think about though. Self timer, you can say, how long is the self timer? How many shots? What's the interval between each shot? Pretty, pretty handy. Power off delay. These are all power settings. I have this turned up to the maximum right now. I would never run this. I keep everything down at 10 to 30 seconds. Right now I'm doing it just because I'm filming this video. And so that's, you know, that's what that's all about. Uh, how many frames in continuous low speed shooting mode? I keep it at three. You might want it at two or at four. Maximum number of shots at burst, 100 is the max. That's where I'm leaving it, just firmware limiting. Exposure delay mode, that actually sets it up so that you push the button, it waits this amount of time, half a second, a second, three seconds, two tenths of a second, takes the image. So you can push the shutter, take your hand off the camera in low lit situations, not induce any shake capture the image. It kind of replaces the old cable release. I use this all the time and I keep it on the eye menu. What type of shutter? Is it mechanical or electronic? I just leave it in auto. The camera makes good decisions about that. Extended shutter speeds. I leave this turned on. This takes it from 30 seconds up to 8,000th of a second to 900 seconds up to 8,000th of a second. And it scrolls through and stops, so it doesn't take you that long to scroll from 900 seconds to 30 seconds, but it lets you take up to a 15 minute exposure without any kind of external cable or controller. It's a really, really cool feature. I use all the time doing long exposures with, with neutral density and doing star photography and night photography. It's awesome. File number sequence, you can, I just leave it turned on. Um, apply settings to live view. 
This is one that's interesting. I like that turned on, and that way I actually get a good representation of what I'm about to capture. If I set the camera up underexposed, I'm gonna see an underexposed scene. If I overexpose, I'm gonna see an overexposed scene. You can turn it off if you just want a nice big bright view of what you're doing, but just remember that what you're seeing is not exactly what you're gonna get. I can see some, some times you might wanna turn it off. I like a framing grid. I like the three by three rule of thirds framing grid on when I'm working. Um, focus peaking. I like to use focus peaking level two, kind of medium focus peaking, and I like it to be white. It's less distracting to me. I can choose what colors, but it's really nice. It only pops up when you're doing manual focusing, and you can kind of see the edges of things start glinting and shimmering. Um, view all in continuous mode. I leave that turned on. You've got a bunch of flash settings. Again, we're going to run through flash settings fast. Um, auto bracketing order. Um, you can say flash and speed. That's generally what I leave it at. Bracketing order. This is interesting. I tend to like to leave it at the meter, underexposed, overexposed. And that way the first frame that you see in the group is the correctly exposed one. It also means that that's the metered shot when you're shooting. It gets confusing if you change it off of this. Then the first shot that pops up is going to look underexposed. If you change it to be underexposed, on the meter, overexposed, the first image in your frame, when you have it set to view the images it's going to be captured, is going to look really underexposed when you're in bracketing mode. So I would just, I would suggest, unless you understand this completely, it's going to be confusing to you. And I've had students in my workshops confused. I would leave it at meter, under, over. Um, I think it's just going to work better for you. Let's talk about customizing the eye menu. Here's what I have set up in my eye menu. You, you go into here. And you can scroll around through this grid and change any one of these by just pressing the OK button or touching the screen. And you can choose from this incredibly long list of possible things. They really give you a lot of cool settings. I'm going to leave mine as it is. I don't want to change it. The way I have mine set up is to turn long exposure noise reduction on and off, change my white balance, change my image quality, change my size if I happen to be shooting RAW plus JPEG, turn on silent shutter, change my metering modes, those times when I want to go into spot metering, activate bracketing, how many frames, underexposed, overexposed, what's the bracketing gap, exposure delay mode, which I talked about, which kind of replaces the cable release and lets you capture images in the dark without inducing any shake, um, my release mode, which also includes my self timer, whether or not I have vibration reduction turned on or turned off, um, my autofocus area mode and my autofocus mode, whether it's AFS, AFC, manual focus, and what area mode I'm in, wide area, pinpoint, auto area, autofocus. I'm going to recommend for autofocus mode, you all think about learning to use the auto area, autofocus mode. I have a whole video on using auto area, autofocus mode with the Nikon Z cameras. It's as applicable to this camera as it is to the Z62 and Z72, and I will link that video in this video's description. Uh, it's really the future of autofocus as far as Nikon is concerned. Um, so, all right, so that's under the I menu. If we go into custom controls, there's a few things you can customize. And I would suggest that you customize this front customizable button, this one just to the right underneath the lens that your middle finger easily comes down and rests on, or your ring finger easily comes down and rests on when you're holding the camera. And I like to put subject tracking on that. What that's all about is when I am in autofocus mode, I can tap that button and override the auto area autofocus and I can throw a little box up that I can choose. This is my subject and then hold down the back button and I've locked that subject and I can deactivate that and go back into fully automatic auto area autofocus by just tapping that again. So tap it to activate it, tap it to deactivate it. That's what I leave there. Up under the movie record button, which when you're shooting in still mode, is a totally viable button. It doesn't do anything. It's not going to record any video while you're in still mode. You have to flip into video mode with this little switch under the shutter speed dial. Um, that mode I like to leave for uh, aperture preview, so depth of field preview. This camera doesn't stop down past f5.6 automatically as you're viewing your scene unless you hit that depth of field preview. You'll see a live representation of apertures as small as f5.6, but once you get to f8, f11, f16, you won't see it unless you hit your depth of field preview button. And I like to leave that up next to the shutter button at this movie record button. That's a nice spot for it. You might want to choose something else. I wouldn't customize too many other things except I like 
my lens function buttons. Lens function buttons tend to come on bigger, longer lenses like the 70 to 200 2.8, probably rarely mounted on this lens, but some of those have multiple lens function buttons. If you have those, I like to program one for playback because as I said, this camera has the play button up in the top left. It's kind of an awkward position if you're holding a long lens. If instead you just are able to hit that button with your thumb while you're holding the lens, then you don't even have to look away from the camera. You can review images through the viewfinder. It's really nice. If it has two buttons, the second button I like to have um, my AF on so I can actually autofocus with my thumb on the lens just as well as I can with my thumb on the back button. There you go. All right. So that's my custom settings. You can adjust those to whatever makes the most sense for you. And you can switch and change them around. I actually put this custom control button in my mind menu so that I can easily change that in a different shooting situation. It's one of the things that kind of bums me out. I talk about in my review of this camera. The Z50 has a user one and user two mode in amongst its modes like manual, aperture, shutter, priority, program, auto. It has user one and user two, which are completely programmable settings that would remember a lot of the stuff like custom control assignments. And that's really nice for just being able to flip into a different kind of shooting situation like fast action or wedding silence. Um, this camera doesn't have that, but by putting custom controls in the my menu, you can easily switch it around. Um, custom controls playback. I don't usually mess with that. You can if you want. Customize the command dials. That's for like reversing the directions that the command dials work. I wouldn't mess too much with that. I don't personally. Some people like them to go the opposite direction than you would normally spin. The release the button to use the dial. So if you push a button that you have to hold down while you spin the dial, this will let you set it so you push the button, then you spin the dial, push it again to lock it. I just like to push the button and spin the dial, but other people might like to change that. Reverse indicators for the underexposed, overexposed image. I like underexposed on the left, overexposed on the right. Some people might be used to something different. And then we come into the video customizations. You can go through and customize your video settings the same way that you can customize your, your camera settings. For example, you can change everything in the I menu. There's a quick view of what I have set up in my video I menu. I've got picture control, white balance, microphone sensitivity, video quality, wind noise reduction, metering, active D lighting, Wi-Fi connection, electronic. These are basically out of the box, but most of them are things that I would choose to use if I were uh, changing my video settings around. Custom controls. The one thing I like to do in my custom controls is I set my function button, that one function button you've got up front to be a clear view, uh, live view information off. So what it does is it just clears everything off the viewfinder or the back monitor so you can actually see just what you're recording to video. And that's really important for, for people doing video work to not have all the exposure information and settings kind of block in their view of what they're videoing. And I wish they would just put that in the different view rotation that you have with the touch button on the back screen for different display modes. But instead they've got it as a custom button assignment. Um, so it doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather have it be in the display toggle rotation, but they've put it here and in video, it's important enough to me that I put it on that function button so that I can flip between seeing my exposure information and not seeing it with a button press instead of having to go into a menu. Um, so that's all I'll really talk about in the video setups. There are some settings like autofocus speed, autofocus tracking sensitivity, things if you're autofocusing doing video, a little bit uh, fancier stuff, highlight display, whether or not you've got zebra stripes turned on or not. I actually kind of like zebra stripes to come on at some threshold. You know, that's, that's all about, you know, 255, 255, 255 is pure white. I like to get a view of things that are that are getting to the edge of 255, 255, 255. Higher, it's more for the video shooters, but it's nice to have set up that way. Let's go into the setup menu. And we've got information display. You can choose whether it's dark on light, light on dark. I like dark on light. Um, you can fine tune your autofocus. That's more important for DSLRs, frankly, than it is for these mirrorless cameras. The mirrorless cameras tend, because of the way that they do contrast detection right on the sensor, uh, or phase, the way that they do their autofocus right on the sensor, it just negates the need for calibrating the lens to the camera. You can get slightly more accurate. You can go in and still do it, but you don't really need to. 
Um, Non-CPU lens data, that's for using old manual focus Nikon lenses that don't meter and couple and pass electronics through to this camera and just telling it what lens is on that, uh, on that FTZ adapter and what's its maximum aperture so that it can meter the lens as you manually focus and adjust its aperture. Save focus position, this is a cool one. This is one that I wish was on the Z50. It came with the uh, Z62 and Z72. Actually, I haven't tested if the firmware update brought this to the Z50 or not. It brought it to the Z6 and Z7 after it came out on the Z62 and Z72. It actually saves where you were focused last when you turn off the camera and turn it back on or pull its battery out and put it back in. It's a really nice thing for landscape and still life shooters. Um, Image dust off reference photo, that's if you just, I tend to blow my sensor out and clean it instead of doing image dust off re, uh, sensors. Pixel map, that's, that's not stuff I'm gonna go through and have you really mess with. It, it can help hot map hot pixels and things like that. Image comments, if you wanna comment on your images, make, make uh, voice notes. Copyright information, you can go in here and set up your artist, you know, who you are and what your copyright's all about. I tend to do that on my own cameras. That's your own choice. If you want to amend that to your, um, to your image, you can set an artist statement and a copyright information. I tend to do that on the cameras I work long with. I'm borrowing this camera, so I haven't. Beep options, off. I leave that off. I don't like beeps happening when I'm out working, particularly with a group of people. Touch controls, I love being able to touch the touch screen, so I leave that turned on. Um, we'll go back in self-portrait mode. That's when you flip the, the screen around. It flips it over and lets you see your own, it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, HDMI, these are just choices of how the HDMI information transmit out if you connect an HDMI cable to your TV or to a switcher to use for zoom or record the screen like I'm doing. Airplane mode just shuts down the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. You can connect it to your phone or your tablet through the uh, excellent Nikon SnapBridge software. I love that software. You can connect up to a computer to shoot, uh, to shoot tethered. Um, there are wireless remote control options. You can also just use SnapBridge or a Bluetooth controller um, to, to control the camera wirelessly. Conformity marking, you know, that's just giving you data. USB power delivery, yes, that's what I'm doing right now. This camera's staying nice and full while I have it turned on with no limit on its power off or anything because I have a power delivery capable USB-C plug plugged into it. You can use a anchor battery brick like I have in my links. If you go to my links and look at necessities or look at the mirrorless cameras that I work with, I have a couple of different affordable anchor battery solutions that will power your camera as much as four of the Nikon batteries just by plugging it in via USB-C. Um, HudsonHenry.com slash ATS links, I have those, they're awesome. Um, I always leave that turned on. Energy saving mode, just make sure that you don't burn your battery out. Slot empty release lock, I like to lock that. I like to leave it locked because that way you don't accidentally think you're taking photos when there's no SD card in the camera. Save and load the menu settings. Once you get your menu all set up the way that you like it, you can save those menu settings. Right now I just saved them, they're on this memory card. I would get a small little memory card, you know, a cheap one. 32 gigabytes if you can find one, an SD card. Put it in there, save your menu settings to it once you get it all set up. Lock it away in a box so that you've got it if you ever need it back, mark it menu settings. Um, you can reset all your settings, you can take a look at your firmware version, update your firmware. Um, we've got the retouch menu, that's only if you're actually wanting to edit an image in camera, I never do that. And then there's the My Menu. And the way that you add things to the My Menu, you just go in here and you say Add Items and you go into which menu you wanna to go to and choose an item to put in the My Menu. It's that easy. If you want, I'm going back right now. If you wanna remove something, same process. You click Remove, scroll through and check the ones you wanna remove. I don't wanna do any of them. I like all the My, my Menus that I have in here. You can rank it, you can go up, grab one, move it around in the lineup. All right, so what we've got in here for my My Menu, you know, yours might vary, but I like to have format my memory card. Back in the old days, cameras had a two button reset method where you push a button on the left side of the camera, you push a button on the right side of the camera, you hold it down for two seconds, let go, press it again, it formats the memory card. 
They got rid of that. I think it's coming back on the Nikon Z9. I don't know if it'll come back to cheaper cameras too in the future, but I liked that. I miss it. So I put format memory card up at the top of my main menu so that after I get my card cleared, backed up on my computer on two drives, I can format the card and keep shooting. Auto ISO sensitivity control, turning that auto ISO on and off. Click right there um, since there isn't an easy external button method. Exposure delay mode, I have it here too. It's in my eye menu, I could probably lose it here. Auto bracketing, same thing, I have it in both places. Custom controls, that's where I say you can go in and you can change what that function button and what that movie record button do in a different situation where you suddenly want it to be something other than subject tracking and depth of field preview. Easy to change right there, you don't have to go diving through the menus trying to remember where it is. Interval timer shooting, that's what I use for time lapse. Focus shift shooting, that's what I use for focus uh, stacking. Silent photography, just when you want to be stealthy, you don't want to bother people in a live event. AF activation, that's that button I said I put it in my mind menu so I can really easily set it so that someone I hand the camera to, if they push the shutter button, it's going to focus. Um, that way we get our pictures back with our eyes in focus. Monitor brightness, uh, that's just something I use when I'm shooting in low lit situations in night scenes. I like to turn it way down, otherwise I just leave it at its default to zero. Power off delay, I keep that because I do these sorts of videos and I want to be able to easily jump in and tell it to just basically never shut itself off while I'm recording a video like this and recording what it puts out. So those are my basic settings. I will talk really quickly about autofocus settings. Um, and what I'm gonna do is hit my eye menu. If I was to jump in here and you could choose between auto area, autofocus, or autofocus auto, so it automatically decides based on the scene that it sees happening on its sensor, whether you want a static subject, not moving at all, um, and you want a lock focus and focus to be your priority like a landscape or a still life, or whether you're shooting action, that's AFS, or whether you're shooting action, AFC, where it continues tracking things that are moving and tries to lock on to subjects that are moving. You know, I tend to choose myself, but AFA, it seems to do a pretty reasonable job of determining what you're working with. I tend to leave it in AFC or AFS, or there's manual focus mode, all right? So right now I'm in manual focus. Let's say we jumped into AFC. Now there are different area modes within that. And let me just quickly explain each one. You got single point area focus, autofocus. So now if I go onto my screen, I've got this single point. I can touch, I can move around. I can do what I want to do and choose what I want in focus. Now, I wouldn't use that very often in continuous autofocus, but I would use it in the single servo autofocus where I'm shooting a still life. This is the important rock in my scene. I'll lock on it. Um, a still life. Where do I want my focus to be set? This lets me go right to there. If I hit the zoom button, it's going to zoom in on where that point happens to be. All right, so that's important stuff. All right. Now, let's go and look at a different one. Let's look at um, dynamic area autofocus. That's a point that you move around and it's going to look at points around it and try to keep the subject track that's in it. It's a kind of a legacy mode from the DSLR. It didn't work very well when they first came out with the Z cameras. They've improved it, but I still feel like it's a legacy mode. It's kind of like when they put center weighted metering into these modern cameras and the matrix metering was so good. It's that people were used to working with center weighted and they'd kind of freak out if they lost it. But evaluative metering and matrix metering are really a lot better than center weighted metering in 90% of the situations that you would work in. In those others, I'd rather use spot metering and make my own decision. So in, in this case, I almost never use dynamic area autofocus anymore, even though it's really all I used in the day of the DSLR. Um, so it's just a change that's happened with mirrorless. There's wide area autofocus. That's a really cool mode where it just has a big wide area that any subject that happens to be in that wide bracket, it's going to look for. Let's have a look at what that looks like out on the camera. So that's your wide area autofocus. Um, Going back in here, using the touch screen, you've got wide small, you got wide large. When you go into wide large, it's a bigger area that you can move around the screen. And if you want, with the ZFC, this is something that the Z50 doesn't have, you can choose wide area with face and eye detect for people, wide area with face and eye detect for animals. So that will be looking for eyes or faces within that wide area. 
So if there's multiple subjects running around in your frame, you can put the area over the one that's important to you and have it focus just in that bracketed area that you have set out there. That's a nice feature. Then there's auto area autofocus. This is what I use 90% of the time. When you go out and look at the frame, oh, I didn't choose it, hold on, go back in here. Auto area autofocus, hit okay. Now, when I'm out looking at it, you'll see there's, it's looking all over for subjects. If I'm tracking with a frame filling subject, tracking with the camera, it'll lock on it. If there's eyes on that subject, it'll lock on the eyes. If there's a face but the eyes aren't distinct, it'll lock on the face. It does a really great job and with each firmware version coming, it gets better and better. Again, I've got a whole video on using that. In the rare circumstances when I'm shooting action and the auto area autofocus is having a problem, I hit that button that I have set, the function button up front, and override the auto area autofocus to throw a subject tracking box up and put that subject tracking box on my subject and it'll follow my subject all over the frame that I've selected. I find that I generally need to do that when my subject is small and there's multiple subjects and the camera has a hard time choosing between them. That's where subject tracking comes in really, really handy. When you've got large frame filling subjects that are moving, it just finds them by itself without you indicating a point at all. It's really amazing. All right, and so with that, you have auto area autofocus. You have it with eye detect. That's what I generally leave mine in in case I'm photographing people animals if I happen to be photographing animals. When I'm in action mode, my camera sits just like this or with animals, one of the two. When I'm shooting landscapes, it's either gonna be in single area autofocus mode at pinpoint, Boom, it looks like that. I choose my pinpoint place I wanna focus on. You know, I can touch the screen and move it around and I'm pinpoint choosing what I want in focus with a scene that's not moving at all or I'm in manual focus mode and I just let the camera make, you know, I, I'm gonna manually focus. I can zoom in as I'm doing it and really look at that part of my scene that I'm focusing. You can see a little slice of my, of my uh, studio back way back against the wall as I zoom back out. I know that's in focus because it's messy back there. I'm gonna throw it back out of focus with that nice 2.8 aperture. That's basically how I set up and use my camera. I really think it's important that you think about what you set for your function button for its customization, what you set for the movie record button for its customization, what you put in your eye menu that you're gonna be frequently using. You know, use it if you feel like you're missing something, you're having to go into the menus to get it too often, either put it in my menu or the eye menu. You know, set it up so that you can easily customize it for the way that you like to shoot. This is a powerful, little camera with a lot to offer for anybody um, getting into photography who wants it as a travel camera, a street shooting camera that's unobtrusive, that people smile when they see pulled out and pointed at them. Um, it's also just a great camera for those of us who love the old school Nikons that we remember from yesterday. So I hope that uh, everyone's enjoyed this setup video. I've had a ton of fun making it. Again, I have a full review of this camera. I have links to buy it and the lenses that go well with it. Kind of a comparison video with it in the Z50 is the, uh, is the review video. Thanks again to B&H for letting me use this camera uh, and get a good feel for it, review it, do the setup video. I've been enjoying the heck out of it. Um, and I think anybody like you that has one is gonna really enjoy it. It's a fun, camera to shoot with. All right. Thanks everybody. I'm Hudson. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, check out my approach in the scene videos. They're published every single Thursday. There's a new video. So thanks a lot for watching.